you guys are the people you crossfield rick shields all of those kind of people who have got this massive following and i wanted i, I really wanted to to go a little deep in it and and ask you guys what's been the magic formula i know there is no one formula other than i, I got one idea but but how did it start how did you guys get to where you are today oh do you know what i think it's um we get asked this a lot, but the magic formula, as you know, Andrew, is it's passion, consistency, and desire. It's, it's those real simple things. It's no one quick thing that's going to get you, you know, a million followers. It's like, well, look, we do what yeah. we love. And we saw an opportunity. We had a vision of, of something that we saw was heading in that, in that route. And we, we sacrificed quite a bit to say, well, let's go down this route and, um, Let's be consistent. Let's deliver some value to the world of golf and, uh, and let's see where it takes us. And I think that was eight years ago, 2012, we really started that. And um, it's grown and it's, it's in these situations now, in a situation like we're in now, it's, it's allowing us to continue to, to work, which is, which yeah. is fantastic in this climate, which is, yeah. you know, which is, I think a lot of people now are realizing that, okay, I need to, I need to get online and do something online. Yeah, I, I think diversification is so important. And I was talking with my wife and, and I've got a good coaching business and we've got a good little thing that we, we run together. Uh, but it is exceedingly reliant on travel. I teach most of the golfers yeah. that I teach travel into Savannah to come and see me. They travel in from all over the world, all over America. They come to golf schools. And then we do trips and we do seminars and all of those three things include one word, travel. Yeah. What, what you guys do is you can do this in your back garden uh, really as, as long as you need to because people don't need to travel to get access to you. They don't need to travel for you guys to continue to be successful and grow, and grow what you've already done such a great job growing. Yeah, it's... Um... It's, it's a bit strange doing it in the back garden because uh, yeah. <laughs> it used to be on the golf course. We've got the net and it feels strange, but I actually quite like it as well because I think, um, I think what we've done over the last few years is we've built this brand and we've got this sort of, you know, hopefully it comes across, across quite professional. And, and yeah. uh, I think what this has enabled us to do is sort of go, well, look, this is our, it shows a bit of us and our lives and look, we've got a garden and we're real people. And it's like, well, this is sort of, uh, I think it's almost more connecting, really. And I think, in a, in a, obviously, it's a sad state of affairs, what we're in. But I think there's always opportunities and there's always good things that happen in, in situations of, um, I, I suppose, of struggle. You know, and you, and you, yeah. you know it, en it enables people to connect, which I think everyone's doing now, popping on lives all over the place. So mm. um, it's strange to be in this environment, but you take the positives and you look at what the opportunities are to to help people and continue to move forward the best you can. And, uh, and that's what we're all trying to do, obviously. Yeah. You know, one thing, Andy, you didn't mention, and, and, and I really think this is the magic, is uh, you've taken your passion, you've had a vision, you've had a picture of where you wanted to go, you've set some goals, some objectives, uh, but you've worked your butts off. You guys yeah. have... You know, I see you, I see you guys typically once a year at the PGA show and it's you guys going in that direction and me going in that direction and you've got some camera crew with you and you're off, you know, and it's like, hey, how's it going? Bye. Kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, simply because you guys are working. When you're there, you're working. Um, and based on what I see. I have a helicopter going over by. What are these people doing? Don't they know well, we've got, got Instagram going live by, going on here? Uh, you guys have really, really worked your butts off, and uh, that's I, I, that's the message that I think golf coaches need to hear. You've put yourselves out there, uh, you've taken some risks, and it's really it, uh, ultimately it's paid off. That's the only way that people in any industry are going to get ahead. Is you're going to take some risks, you're going to work your tail off, and you're going to like I, another thing I like that you said is. Consistent, consistent, consistent. Yeah, you've been consistent. You've worked consistently hard. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's how it happens. You know, you're right. And I think the, um, 
I'd say we work harder than we did at the start now as well. I mean, when we started it, we were working hard, but I think we work harder now. Like we both get up early in the morning. Like, you know, I'm up at 5.30, Pierce is very similar. And there's so much going on that we just have to sort of continue to work hard and, and do that. So, I mean, I think for the guys who are trying to start something and think it's easy and think, you know, they can put a couple of videos out and they can, you know, why aren't I getting followers and why aren't I getting traction? Why aren't these brands coming to me for sponsorships? It's like, well, you have to be patient, but you've got to work your, your butt off and mm. work fast. So you, you hear a lot of people talk about, oh, you shouldn't be patient. But patience, I think, is oh, patience yeah. is long, in the long term is good. But in the short term, you've got to act fast. Mm. And and be consistent with it as well. And I think that we're we're always busy. We're always trying to learn. We're always trying to think about what's new and and how we can deliver messages and things like that. But it's always for us. It always comes back to what value are you going to deliver to people, and how can this video or this bit of content really make a difference to somebody? And what are the practical tools that they can take immediately away from it and use straight away without without getting confused and have the understanding behind what you're talking about as well. That's, that's a big one for us because you know what it's like as well, Andrew, with the, with social media, it's, it's almost like a magazine. People can read a magazine article and work a tip and it could be completely not the right thing for them to do. Yeah. So it's, it's our job to go, well, we want to deliver a, maybe a tip or something that's useful to people, but make sure that they fully understand it because when they go away, if they don't understand what you're talking about, then they're not going to be able to repeat it on their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you guys do that, Andy? What's, what's the... I know you use some really cool graphics in your videos, which is something that a, a lot of golf tips, certainly mine, do not incorporate because that takes a level of expertise in that field to do that. You guys obviously learned how to do that or you knew somebody who, who, who could do that for you from a pretty early point. And yeah. how does that happen? How do you guys, you put out some fabulous information. It's really spot on. And I, I certainly don't have the time. I wish I did to watch all of it. I don't, but I, I, I'll, I'll sit down every now and then and watch a tip or something that you guys put out. And it's all spot on, I've got to say. But it looks cool and the graphics and all that really push it to a new level. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not me and Pierce who know what they're doing with the graphics. We haven't got a clue with that. <laughs> so okay. from an early point, we had a couple of other guys who were in with the business and um, they started off doing all the, the graphics. So we would do the content that we would get it to them and they would, they would jazz it up. But we just only saw that as a, a necessity to paint the right picture because you know, in golf as well, so many people have the wrong concepts and if they've got the wrong concepts, then they're not going to produce the right motion. Mm. And for us, the graphics just made that so much easier to communicate so people can just go, okay, I, I totally get it now because we put this art graphic in or we put this angle graphic and it, it just makes yeah. sense of things. And, um, and I think what a lot of people probably don't realize is that we've got 11 people in the business now. Wow, that's so awesome. There's a, me and Pierce, the coaches, we've got three editors who are full-time. We've got two marketing people. We've got a manager. There's, there's, there's a whole team behind us as well now, which is, which is another challenge on top of the coaching. So yeah. that's why I say I'm working harder and harder because it, it's not just now about going, let's go and make a video. We've got to manage a team of staff and try and, mm. uh, try and juggle all these things around now. And, and now it's a real business as well. So we're having to learn that side of things and, um, but it's, it's fun, it's exciting, it's a challenge and, and we love it. You know, we get up every day and we just cannot wait to get at it, really. And Andy, if I may ask, I, I, I'm not asking for any secrets here, but do you guys map out, like, obviously, there's no planning on COVID-19. However, in normal times, would you guys say, okay, in April, we've got this. In May, we've got this. In June, we've got this. And you've got things mapped out. And you uh, just, how does that work? Yeah, we, we're getting better at it. We get it each year. I, th I think each year we're getting more and more organized. <laughs> sure. And um, we're just still finding our way. And, and, you know, we might have a trip that come up, comes up. We have to fly away. And then that completely just throws everything off. So, we try and get as much done as we can ahead of time. And uh, I mean, currently with the situation, 
we're actually planning, me and Pierce have been planning most of the day today, um, a, a coaching plan that's going live in December. So okay. we're all, we've almost finished that and we've already planned out and like a chipping plan that we're doing as well. So this, is, this time has enabled us to go, well, let's get ahead of the game. Let's plan. Let's use this time yeah. and create this. And uh, so, yeah, we get, we've never done that before. We've never had something done in April for something, you know, that's going to go live in December. So uh, we, we're far from completely where we want to be, but we just keep getting better and uh, keep getting more organized. And Andy, you guys have had some cool interactions oh, with yeah. – Players from all over. You've had some cool interactions with players from. Andrew. You're there. You're getting a phone call. Okay. Are you back? I'm back. That's it. That's it. You're back. Okay. Um, tell that person to call back later, Andy. You're 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 busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys have had some cool interactions with players from all over the world and and tremendously high high caliber golfers. Um. What's been a couple of cool stories, a couple of cool experiences that you've shared with some of those players? I saw you guys doing a chipping thing with John Rahm. That looked great. And uh, yeah. give us some, some background there. So, yeah, I mean, the, the funny story about the John Rahm one, actually. So we did the TaylorMade shoot in November. And we had, there was a, a, the, the biggest shoot they've had in terms of players. They had Colin Morikawa, DJ, Tiger, Rory, Maria Fassi, a new young, a young girl on the scene. Yeah. Um, and we had some time with everybody but Tiger and Ram. And um, we were just getting ready for a, uh, for a, a shoot with Matt Wolf. Okay. And, um, and one of the guys who was looking after Ram came over and said, uh, when are you with Ram? And we're like, well, we haven't got Ram. And he says, well, Ram's asking, where, where are the, me and my golf guys? I want to do, I wanna, I wanna do some fun stuff. That's cool. So, so anyway, like, there was nothing planned with him. We hadn't planned anything, no content planned. And we just said, well, let's just go over. And we'll just stick a mic on him and just chat about his short game. And uh, we got like a five to 10 minute video. And it was just, it was incredible that what he was doing. He was basically what he did. He just, he basically just showed off his skills to us. He was just showing off, but it was so yeah. good because his confidence, it was just like, yeah, come over here. I want to show you how good I am. And we just, <laughs> we, we're saying, hit it out that lie, hit it out that lie, hit it off a down slope to that tight flag. And he was just doing all of them. And he, it was so impressive. It was, and, and it just makes you think with, with Ram, you see it on the golf course, you see how, how he wants to win and he's not scared of winning. And when, you, when you're in that environment and you see the character that he is, he's going to be a world number one, I think, in my eyes because of just how, how confident he is with his game. Yeah. He doesn't doubt anything. He, he knows his ability and he's, I mean, he, he look, look at the results he's had, obviously winning the DP World last year and the Irish Open is... It's just so good. He really, he really is. He, it's, it, there's definitely, when it comes to winning those, those events that well and truly count, the majors, there's got to be that level of maturity, that level of calm that is not typically around in a younger, aggressive, flamboyant golfer like he is. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, he's, what is he, 24, maybe 25? And, um, you know, he's won so much already. I, yeah. mean, I saw his first win at Torrey Pines. I saw him knock that long put in on the last yeah. to, to win at Torrey Pines and actually spoke to him the next day, interviewed him the next day. And since then, I think it just shows that he can win. And I think you put him in a, in a situation on, a, on, a, on the back nine of a major, I think he's the sort of guy who's just going to close it out. Because he, he's, I just don't think he sees or doubts his abilities at all. Where I think some of the other guys... Uh, between the ears might not be as mentally strong as him, but mm. he's got the maturity of uh, a, an exper a real experienced guy. But I suppose he's experienced. Yeah. You know, he's won multiple times now, so he, he knows he can do it and put him in a situation that he, I think he's going to get the job done, definitely. With, uh, that must have been a really cool experience being at that, that, that shoot that TaylorMade put on because uh, there's certainly no shortage of names in that, in that grouping there. What did you guys say when you saw that? Well, you had time with everyone except Ram and Tiger. Come on, right? Give it. Give well, we were. Scoop. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've, the good thing is if we've we've done a few bits with Ram already, but we were still disappointed because he's good and he's he's obviously uh, he's a character as well. But Tiger, Tiger's there for a day, and um, the other guys are there for two. 
and Taylor made were going, look, you're not having anything a tiger is ours, basically. Yeah. Um, but we were pushing. We we're saying, look, can we get look ten minutes with Tiger would be good. Um, you, you know, hopefully we'll be there this year if there's another one this year, which I think there will be, and uh, we'll just keep pushing for Tiger. I mean, to get Tiger on the range, hitting some iron shots, or get him on a par three and just talk to him about his yeah, anything. His, well, anything, yeah, anything. Yeah. Um, just would be it would just be that would that would be the best thing that we've ever done. But I mean, we. You know, doing stuff with DJ, Matt Wolf and, and Rory. You know, we finish these things. It's, Not bad. Finish these, it's, it's brilliant. And we, st we still are very so grateful of the experience. We finish these and we'll go, we'll have a chat, me and Pierce, and we'll go, what's just happened there? You know, we've just, we've just done, a, done something in the bunker with Rory and DJ and all these guys. And we're like, this is pretty crazy, really. You know, because we never expected that to happen. It's just like, yeah. well, let's put out content to help people. And then... Now we're standing in the bunker with Rory McIlroy talking to him about his bunkers, which yeah. is pretty surreal, really. But it's just such a great experience to be in that environment as well. Super cool. Out of And I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here, Andy. Out of those players that you guys got to hang out with on that occasion, not so much in terms of hitting, but just in terms of interaction, who... Who did you who did you guys feel like was the easiest to work with? Who was the most open, the most forthcoming? Uh Rory and Day. Really? Yeah. Rory and Jason Day, yeah. I mean, yeah, just so they make the, the, the content and the videos so easy because they're just so relaxed. And I think the weird thing is when you speak to Rory or you meet these guys, you just realise that Rory's just a normal guy and you go, yeah. Well, he just wants to have a chat like everybody else, really personal below. You know, he's asking us questions and and uh, to be a guy who's at the top of his game like that, who, which generally the, the, the world revolves around him, to yeah. still have the humility to go, mm. so what, what, what are you guys doing and what's next for you? And he's really interested in you as well, which is a class act. And Jason Day is the same as well. He's, he's good fun, actually. He's good fun. He's the one who gives Tiger a bit of grief. And uh, oh, yeah, he's probably the only one who can, I think. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there's not many. I'm sure there's not many who can. I don't think so. But he takes. He seems to take it off. But off day, days, days. The sort of uh, he holds court when he's there. Okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. And um, what was Maria Fassi like? She's a farmer, isn't she? Oh, she was. She was great. I mean, we we sort of did walk in the hole with her. We played the hole with her and talked to her about her career and a golf swing a little bit. But I think the. The best part of it was we were hanging around. We went to Orlando after the shoot. And um, Maria was there at Champions Gate with Ledbetter. Yeah. So we actually just fixed the game up and we went and played um, Isleworth with Maria. Yeah. And uh, just to have a game with Maria was great because she was, she was, I mean, she just smashes the golf ball. You know, 109, 110 mile an hour club head speed. And uh, I mean, she was up with us on our, on our not so good ones, but she was... Yeah. She wasn't far behind us on, a, on, on our like best either. <laughs> she yeah. was, so I think, I think she's, she's going to be one to watch. She's going to be one to watch. But such a nice girl as well. Really, yeah. real good attitude. Very mature. She's in very mature as well. Very similar to cool. Ram. Cool. And Andy, come on. Let's talk about the everyday golfer. I know there's a bunch of golfers who are tuning in now and are going to, going to tune in in the future. What would your message be? You've seen a lot. You get a lot of feedback on all your different channels out there as to, well, this helped me or what was this and how did this work? What is your take? And, and, and I said to train. Right again. Train. Okay. Um, what is your take on what golfers need? What does the everyday 15 handicapper, and we're obviously talking generally here, what does the everyday, everyday 15 handicap golfer need most in order to start playing better? I, th I think there's, um, there's a couple of key things that just always show up for me. And that's whether it be people online or, or people, people who we coach. Um, and I think that the first thing is club face. So I, I just think there's so many golfers out there who, who overlook the importance of the club face. And they're looking at all these bigger moves of what's going on in terms of their their plane or their club path. And they, they're trying to fix these things, but often what's causing these things is maybe the, the actual position of the face throughout the backswing potentially. And I think if they were to attack the club face or manage that club face better on the backswing, 
all of a sudden they, it's like, it's the key to changing everything because then we don't have to make these compensations, these big compensations, which show up as, as swing faults, if you like. And then we can, then it gives us the green light to change them. But you can see people trying to change a, a fault or a symptom, let's say, and they're just getting nowhere with it because actually there's something else that's just stopping them from, from doing that. So I'd say club face is a big one. And it's the thing is with a golf swing, you can see the big movements, can't you? But you can't necessarily, you see the intricacies of the wrist angles or the club face. Yeah. So golfers aren't looking out for that. Um, the next thing I'd say is just the pivot motion, how, how they move their body. And I would say, I had a conversation the other day, I think it might have been with um, Jonathan Yarwood, actually. And we were just talking about, well, look, the difference between a tour pro and an amateur is that they can have some funky looking backswings and, and it'd be okay because they've got the time and the skill to, to be able to get it back to a good delivery. Whereas mm. the average guy who's playing golf once a week and maybe practicing once a week, it's more important for them to have a, a good backswing in terms of maybe how the body moves and how the synchronization of where the arms are and things like that. Mm. Uh, because then the less compensations they have to make, the easier it's going to be. And I think certainly creating yeah. a better pivot motion, allowing the hips to work in a good manner. Um, there's not many golfers who come to me or, that, or Pierce that we say, okay, I want you to turn the hips a little less. You know, we generally yeah, yeah. say, I want you to rotate a little bit more. Let's create some room for the swing, to, for the club to swing. And yeah, uh, yeah so I think, I, think, I think how the body moves, the importance of the backswing for amateurs uh, and the club face are just key. That's huge. I, I love that you said that you pretty much said club face and pivot. And honestly, I would have picked the exact same two things. Uh, I've often said that changing the club face has the power to change the shape of your golf swing. And so often golfers are looking to, uh, I'm casting the club or I'm coming down steep. Well, why? It's because your club face is out of position. Fix the club face and all of a sudden you're going to Keep some yeah. lag on the way down. You're going to get that club shallowing. It's going to look better. You're going to feel much happier. Not yeah. to mention you're going to hit the ball better. And then pivot. Something that, that, that I think about often is, is why is Jack Nicholas not that good anymore? Well, yeah, he's, he, can't, he can't move, can he? He can't move. He, <laughs> he can't, can't move. He, he, that steepness on the way back now is harder when you don't turn as much. He, he just, yeah, his, his body is such that he cannot generate the speed and make the movements that he did when he was a much younger man. And so, yeah. it, 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 to me, a truth, Jack Nicklaus didn't lose his ability to think. He knows just as well today how to play as he did when he won the Masters in 86. Um, and so golfers need to understand the value of being able to move, I think. You've got, if you want to move that club properly, you've got to be able to move your body pretty well. Yeah, no, yeah, no question. And I think it's, um, it's funny because over the last couple of years, I've, uh, I've started doing yoga. And yes. um, the reason that I started doing yoga is because the majority of the people who come to see us on the lesson tee are 45 to 55-year-old men who yeah. I'm going okay, I need to get your turn in a bit better. I need you. And I'm going, well, actually, your right hip is a little tight or your thoracic spine's a bit tight. Okay, we might need to shorten things down or find a way to, to work around your, your restriction. And yeah. I'm like, well, if I start doing yoga now when I'm 55, hopefully I can actually still have some movement in my hips and my spine. So, um, you know, it's almost just trying to predict where I can be and, and keep, my, keep my body healthy, really. And I think that's such, a, such an important yeah. thing. It's a massive thing. Just why is Jack Nicholas not good now? Because his body doesn't do today what it did then. And I think we've all got to be working, certainly myself included. We've all got to be working towards staying mobile, staying strong to a certain point, strong enough. And that's pretty much it. If we can do that and stay yeah. strong enough and, and flex enough, uh, we're going to be in good shape for a long, long time. Yeah, I think you look at Gary Player and it's like, well, you look yeah. at what he's done and how he still swings the golf club. And yeah. it's because he can move well. He moves his body well, doesn't he? And yeah. He can still get out there and do it. So it's, uh, it's a key part to, to certainly, I think for the majority of amateur golfers who, who are listening to this, even just find a way to have something that's going to be 
um, that's a program to keep you moving for longer. You know, longevity is such an important thing in this game. And you look at all the, the best players in the world now, they're training for performance and power. But one thing they're training for as well is for longevity. They're looking to be yeah. in the game for a, a lot longer. And the senior tour now, the Champions Tour, it's, it's competitive. And those guys want to continue to get out there and, and earn, their, earn their dough on the Champions Tour. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the message is the same for the everyday golfer. Of course it is. Most everyday golfers, you get, if you're lucky, you get to play on a Saturday or a Sunday. You got to yeah. work. Well, one day you're going to retire, and when you retire and you've got a big pot of money and you can go out and play golf three times a week, well, now the body's done. And so you've yeah. got to look after them. If you want to really be able to enjoy that, I think it's so important. Yeah, it is. It is. Andy, what, what do you guys talk about in your message to golfers pertaining to statistics? I call it numbers because there's so much that falls under that heading of numbers in a di just beyond statistics, uh, decision making, Scott Fawcett and his decade system, and all of these ways to think and make decisions and play and practice and understand where you're strong and where you're weak. Do you guys talk about statistics much? Yeah, we do. I think it's an area that, that we're probably exploring a little more now. Um, and I think the, the, I mean, obviously statistics, especially on tour, showing that the how important the approach shots are. You know, the proximity of approach shots are, are massive. And I think that if golfers were to focus on the right area, you know what golfers are like, they go down the driving range and work at the wrong things. But yeah. I think the importance of getting the approach shots and the iron shots are, are just so important. And I mean, yeah, strategy and things like that with the decade and stuff, it's all great. And I think it's, uh, it's just an area that is, is overlooked by so many mm. and... And I think one of the reasons we'll go off strat our strategy a, a, a little bit as well is that most of the golfers who are watching the, the best players on tour, they'll, they'll see them hit a shot and let's say they see them knock it to three feet. What the problem is, is what they, what the viewer thinks is that they've hit their spot. And in reality is they've probably missed their spot, but they've ended up being closer yeah. because they picked a, a safe spot that's allowing a bit of freedom. And I think that, what most people then do, most amateur golfers do, is they adopt the, I need to go for every flag. Mm. And actually their approach is a lot more aggressive than a tour pro. Yes. Whereas the tour pros are very calculated. They're going to get, they're going to, they're going to know when they can go at, at flags, you know, when they've got nine aggressive, on in their hands. Aggressive is a kind word you can use there, Andy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a kind word. Uh, we could yeah. use other words. But it's crazy though, isn't it? It's crazy how the, how the, amateurs are more aggressive than tour pros mm. when it comes to you know they're more their strategy they i suppose they haven't necessarily got a strategy they look at a flag and get sucked into it instead of actually looking where the danger is and thinking about their miss or their ball flight tendons tendency yeah. was, is it is it gonna miss there or and then allowing for that and i think it's uh it, it's just it's a message that we're going to be pushing for as long as we're alive i think yeah same with the club face same with the body pivots Mm. It's something that, that's never going to go away. We're just going to keep hammering on that until people just keep understand, understanding it. Totally. I, I think I, I honestly look at it, I've come to look at it in the last few months Andy, as, as, as low-hanging fruit. I think it's easy stuff for golfers to get. And if any golfer wants to save strokes, they've got to get some statistics going on their game they've got to understand percentages and proximities and make percentages from when they're potting. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's just, it's easy stuff that I know 20 years ago wasn't around. And I, and I really think that the coaching community as a whole hasn't yet, we understand it, but we kind of keep it to ourselves. We haven't yet shared this volume of super, super helpful information with the everyday golfer to where they can get out there and, well, I saved three strokes. And you can save three strokes every day just understanding your numbers. A, a cool little picture that I paint for people who come to my three-day golf schools is, and I'm sure you've seen it, is at the end of each day at the Players' Championship, 
on the 17th hole, they show all of those shots yes. and all those shots take off and they come down on the green. Okay. Yes. So we've got PG uh, players championship is typically the strongest field of the year. And it's not a long shot. Let's call it 130 yards. Okay. 135 yards. Tees are forward pins up 135 yards. All the best players in the world are trying to hit this pretty much the same shot. They're trying to land it like 10 feet past the hole and going for the middle of the green and see where it ends up. Okay. So I ask my students, when you see that, that, that fireworks of, of golf balls raining down on the green, let's say seven or eight of them go in the water, which is not many out of 140. And then I say to people, okay, we've pictured that we've seen that. Now let's try to envision what your pattern would look like. <laughs> <laughs> it would be yeah. significantly broader. And then I say to them, where should we aim? And every single one of them says at the middle of the green. But I know if they were to play there and they get up on that 17th hole, they're going to go, where's the pin? I'm, yeah, I got to go at that pin. Of course. No, but but it's, it just, it's so true for, for every golfer. Mark Brody shared with me the other day, he said the average proximity for a 90s shooter a 90 shooter from 150 yards in the middle of the fairway is going to average 56 feet. Yeah, from the, from pin. the 90 shooter. Yeah, I mean, it's For, yeah, that's that's 20 paces. That's almost 20 paces. And here's the 90 shooter aiming at a back left pin. No, 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 we're making a mistake. Uh, it, it's amazing to <laughs> me how you know. You, most often a 90 shooter has to hit a really good drive in order to get their ball in the fairway 150 from the pin. And now we go and ruin that by making a poor decision. It's golfers would be so much better off if they understood these proximities. If they, if they essentially, if you just committed to, I had somebody the other day who was a really, and I'm sorry, I'm talking too much here. No, no, um, good. good. Who, who was, who was a really good player. And I said, listen, from 130 yards in the fairway, I want you to aim at the center of every green. And from 100 yards in the rough, you've got to aim 100 yards and, and, and out. You've got to aim at the middle of every green. Yeah. And uh, it's, it, it, it really is, it's low hanging fruit. And it's something that's easy for people to make simple gains on, I think. It is. And I think what you said is that there's, there's so much valuable information that's not necessarily out there yet or it's mm. not getting consistently put out there. And I think, like you said, I think we went to a, a conference a few years ago and Nick Starchuk, do you know Nick Starchuk? From yes. Canada? Yeah. And he was he was talking about this age in 125 and the average, you know, what the average PGA Tour would do, a guy on the PGA Tour would do. Yeah. And um, it was great because it was all about expectations and really getting an understanding of what the, what the best players, but also what the 125th player in the world will do. And if the average golfer knew what, the, what these guys are doing on tour, the proximity, for instance, from 150, I think they'd be shocked. They'd be mm. thinking it would be like 10 feet. It's 23 feet from 150 in the fairway. 150, exactly. And I think most people would be thinking, well, surely it's, it's what, within 10 feet. Yeah. So if they knew all these things and then they could set real expectations for themselves and not get annoyed when they don't knock it with inside six feet from a hundred yards, you know, and I think mm. that's a whole, a whole other section going on there in terms of then your emotions and how you control your emotions because your expectations are wrong. So um, I agree with you. I, you know, I mean, this is something that we, we love me and Pierce, the whole, yeah. the whole on course, um, I suppose the human side of things, but also we'll, we'll often, we'll do a lot of course lessons at our, at our club. So we'll go out on a Saturday morning with no one around and we'll watch our guys play. And for the first two or three holes, we'll just watch, won't say anything. And then we'll just observe what they do, their routines, their habits, their, what they're saying, their, their reactions, yeah. all these things. And then we'll sort of stop them and we'll go, okay, well, let's talk about this. And let's just talk about this routine that you've done on the green there or how you reacted or what you said. And, and if we went round 18 holes with a guy, like we could save them five shots. Yeah. You know, easily just by the decision making, the thinking, the strategy, you know, I mean, something you said about the middle of the green, we'll often say to our guys, look, we want you to imagine there's no flags there. There's no flags on the green, hit it to the greens. There's no flags there and see what you do. 
because then mm. you're not getting tempted by that flag that's tight right to that pin. Um, but I think that's, that's in one way that's that's great because that's an opportunity now for for us to go. Okay, that's not getting talked about so much. Mm. But I also think it's it's a shame because I don't think people really want it that much either. They want this. Okay, just tell me what I need to do with my wrist, or just can I just change my grip, or can I just move my right foot this way a little bit? And it's yeah. that's the magic. That's the magic sauce. I don't yeah. want to have to go and work at my mental side for like three weeks, <laughs> which is, yeah. which is, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily what people want. It's what they need. Mm. And something that me and Pierce well, always say is that we, we want to give people what they, what they need wrapped up in what they want. Yeah. So yes, people, what people, what they want, you've got to give it to them. But if you can yeah. give them things that they need as well, but it's disguised in what they want, then, then you've got the secret sauce there because yeah. Then you're really hitting everything. That's that's beautifully said. Someone said it the other day. They said high caliber golfers need to lower their score. Higher handicap golfers want to hit it better. Yeah. They just yes. if if they shoot the same and they go out and they flush a couple of five irons and stripe some drivers down the fairway, but they shoot the same score, it's like happy days. That felt good. Uh, a lot of it is to do with how it, how the shots make that higher handicap golfer feel. Yeah, and and you're you're in a predicament there because you go, well, do I keep on hammering what he needs and he's not going to listen to me, or do yeah. I just give him what he wants? And you go, well, if all he wants, we, we some of the, I mean, in the early days when me and Pierce started creating the coaching, we're like, well, let's do something on this, and we go, well, do do they actually want that? It's like, it's like a guy going to McDonald's and saying, him asking for a burger and then you trying to give him a salad. Well, yeah. it's, just, it's just not going to happen. So you're like, well, you have to give the, the, the people what they want. If people are coming to you and saying, well, I want to I get better on my backswing. Well, yes, you have to give them that. But at the same time, to get golfers better, it needs to be, we need, still need to talk about it. And the, the, mm. there needs to be a, a real cool way in which we can do that and put it across. Yeah. With a little bit of what they want. <laughs> yes, because you know this uh, way better than I know this, that if you, if you do a, a, a video titled Important Golf Statistics versus <laughs> yes. Shallowing the Downswing. <laughs> oh, exactly, exactly. What's going to get more views? Exactly. But what's what's going to be more helpful to the score? And that's what you said, that better golfers, high caliber golfers want to lower the score and, you know, not so, you know, lower caliber golfers want to, hit it better and um that's the the predicament that we're in but yeah it's, um you know it's we're in the coaching game so we've, we've got to do our best to to still give people that because we want to help them get better you know get better and get better scores but another i suppose another thing is as well is that some of the golfers just aren't that bothered about the score are they they yeah, aren't that true. bothered about the score they're just like well i want to make my golf swing look better and i'd love to just be able to hit it well yeah. And I go out with my, with my friends on a weekend and have a good laugh. And it's not that competitive. Have a couple of beers on the way around. And uh, I just want to hit it, hit it better. <laughs> yeah. And you yeah. get a lot of people, I think, which are like that. A hundred percent spot on. I, I think too often, particularly coaches and really smart people who are involved in the competitive golfer arena, they lose sight of that. That people will often just play golf for the sheer enjoyment and pleasure that it gives them. They have time to connect with their friends. They can go out and have a laugh, like you said, and they're just looking to hit a couple of good shots. They're looking to have a, a non-negative experience. It doesn't have to be this momentous occasion where they shoot their lowest score. They're just really looking to hit some better shots, maybe hit it a little bit longer and go, that was good fun. Let's do it again next week. You've just described me there, Andrew, as well. That's, that's my golf now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm and, the that same. Is, and that is, you know, it's um, I go out now and play golf, and I want to hit it good. I know I'm going to hit it not so good as well, which is fine. My expectations are where, where they need to be. Yeah. But I'll go out now, and I'm like, as long as I can hit it well and strike it well, I want to strike the golf ball well because it feels great. I don't care if I shoot 78, but yeah. if I've had a great time and I've had some great shots, made a few birdies, and then I've had a good experience. Yeah. And for me, that's that's you know, I don't go and think right. I need to. I need to shoot 69 this week or I really want to try and get my 
you know, golf for me has changed over the last, certainly the last five years, where it's so much more about the enjoyment and the experience. Mm. And um, because that's, I don't need to, I'm not playing golf competitive every week and at a golf club. It's like, I, go, I play now for socializing and enjoy some yeah. time with the friends. And, but it's still important to me. And we are competitive still when we're out there. For sure, for sure. It is on, it is on. But it's in a different way. It's in a different format. Yeah, yeah, true, true that. Do you guys, talking about getting out there and enjoying it and playing some different golf courses, some fun golf courses, do you guys do much along the lines of trips? Do you take, take people on trips? Do you guys do, what does that look like for you guys, Annie? Um, it doesn't look like that anything at the moment, but it's something that we really want to explore. Um, uh, it's just creating that space in the diary for it and making a commitment to it. Yeah. You know, we'd really, we'd really love to do, and I think we talked about this the other week, actually, that we'd really love to do an experience that was for, for somebody who really wanted to go all in on, you know, performance, you know, looking yeah. after their body, looking after their mind, understanding things, and really going deep into becoming a better golfer as opposed to just hitting it well. Yeah. So I think, um, I think we will do those over the next couple of years. I think, we'd, I think if we can get that situation where we're nice and stable with, mm. and we can just make that time in the diary, it's great. And look, we still love coaching golfers. We coach every single week still. And to go and meet new people and travel and maybe do some different experiences. You know yourself, you do these. I think you do a lot in South Africa, don't you? Which is, yeah, yeah. Which are just great, you know, connecting with different people and, and helping mm. them. And it's, it's a, I think it's a great thing. So we will definitely do some more of those. You know, if, if that's what you like to do, then, then, then you should look at it, you know, for sure. Yeah. What, Andy, what percentage, how many hours a week do you guys teach? Between, I'd say, I'd say between six and 10 hours a week. Okay, so not much, eh? Not, not, not a lot. Much. It's mostly no. doing this kind of stuff and filming and, okay. Yeah, yeah the that's... majority, yeah, we'll do a couple of days. It's like a Tuesday afternoon and a Saturday morning, generally. And okay. uh, they're, client, they're clients that we've coached for a long time. So they're long-standing clients that we, that we really enjoy. We've got good relationships with them. We keep, the, you know, we understand them and we know their games and we'll go on the course with them and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a nice mix that we've got we got that. We still enjoy that. And we still love that. Yeah. We still learn a lot <laughs> each time yeah. we do it. You know what it's like. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the majority of the business side of things now is, is definitely more online. The coaching actually is, is more, not I'd say more of a hobby. It's just something we really enjoy doing. We're not necessarily yeah. doing it and going, right, how, how can we really ramp up the revenue in coaching? And, and it's like, well, it's something that we just love doing. Yeah. It's a little bit of a, a break in, in the everyday and it gets you away. And I'm sure it's still, because I know I get this, a lot of the content that I put out comes from my teaching. And I see what yeah. people are struggling with. And I see, okay, come on, we've got, we got to put something out about this. I'm sure you guys get some ideas there. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, it's the same. You, you know, we'll be on the range and Pierce will say, oh, I did this with Steve today. And it just, he was like, he got it straight away. And you go, well, if somebody's got it, and that's work for them. It's got to work for somebody else. So let's share that and do that. And I think it's uh, to be connected with golfers still is just so important for our, for our learning and to, to, understand, to understand what we're doing and what we're putting out there is, uh, is, is, is key. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And how did you guys get involved with golf? How did you guys start golf, Andy? Yourself and Piers. And I see Piers. Piers, thanks for tuning in. I see he's commenting every now and then. Uh, he's answering the questions for us, which is nice. We can just chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, how did you yes, guys get into the game? So I started, uh, I started golf around when I was like 12. And um, I, I, was, I played a load of other sports like soccer. I, I swam, uh, you know, I did tennis, like everything you can think of. I did a lot. And I was reasonable at all of them. I was pretty good yeah. at all sports, which helped for, for the golf. And then yeah. I, um, I started golf at a, a local short course. And then I'd been on a couple of longer courses. I wasn't particularly very good, but I really enjoyed it. And then I joined a golf club down the road. I had to give up soccer to join the golf club down the road. And uh, Pierce was working in the golf shop there at the golf club that I joined. Okay. And uh, I was 13 years old. He was 17 years old. And then we, we sort of played junior golf together and grew up then through the junior golf, uh, I suppose the, the golf there at the, the, the golf club. And, um, 
became friends and he turned pro before me, did the PGA and then I turned pro after him. And then we just said, we always said that he always wanted to be a coach. I always wanted to be a coach. We were both very similar sort of mindset. And we said, wouldn't it be great to do something someday? And then we set up an academy that was at the place where I worked and we did that for six years. And then that was when we sort of started sort of thinking about the, the online stuff. And then we, and then we actually, it's a funny story because we actually just quit the academy. We said, let's, let's quit this academy. We, did, we had a great business there and we yeah. built this academy up and we said, let's quit it and go traveling around the world. <laughs> let's have three months out. Yeah. And let's have, let's make sure we've got nothing to fall back on when we get back. Which sounds really strange to say that. We said, let's just yeah. go and experience. Like, and we went and visited a load of people and golf clubs and coaches and stuff like that around the world. And then we got back with, with nothing but our YouTube channel set up. And we're like, after a bit of time out thinking about it and thinking about what the future was going to be, we were like, yeah, let's go all in on, on this. Let's go all in on me and my golf. Let's, let's, we knew we had this vision and we said, right, let's, this is where it's going to be. If we're patient and we're consistent and we, we put out good stuff for the next two or three years, then, you know, let's see what happens. And we just thought that, you know, something good had happened. Yeah. And, and I, I, you've mentioned the word patient quite a few times. And I really liked your descriptor earlier when you said, when we were talking about coaches and getting stuff out there. It's, and I think what you were implying is this. Long term, you need to be patient. Short term, you need to behave and carry on as if you're impatient. Yes. Yes, exactly that. Exactly that. I think people will mistake patience for going, well, I can just wait around and things are going to happen. Yeah. And um, I think everything that, that we do from a, from a coaching and from, from a business perspective is 10 years, 20 years. It's always long term. It's like, yeah. what? we're always thinking about the, lo you know, the, lo the longevity of the business. And any small decision will always be, will be about that. But we're, we're up and we're acting fast and we are, we're patient for the, for the long game, but we are persistent and, and very fast on doing the stuff that's going to get us there. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're waiting for it, but you're working your tails off now to get it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, yes. I think it's a good message, that. And so, Andy, I've got to ask you this. I put out some content, nothing like what you guys put out, but... Every now and then I put something out there and I go, wow, I cannot believe that that like took off like it did. You guys must have had that one video, <coughs> something that you've put out that just kind of blew your minds and like, whoa, where did this come from? What you got? Yeah, and I think, yeah, we, do you know what? It's funny because you do some videos and you go, right, this one's going to be great. This one is, yes. this is like, we've, we've got the right title. It's really good. It's a great video. It's like, oh yeah, this one's going to just kill it. This is. And then it doesn't necessarily, and you, you, you don't get the results. You're like, what? This isn't impacting anybody. And then I, I remember we did one in, I think it was October 2013, one of, the, one of the early ones. And it was like, it was just a very basic video, 10 minutes long. And we're just talking about a little bit of more of a concept about the, you know, the way the club moves in the swing and, you know, yeah. talking about the swing arc and things like that. And I think now it's had like over 8 million views and we're like, wow. How how That's is even amazing. you know and it's, it still gets views now. It's still one of our best performing videos from like seven years ago, and it's like, what was what was so good about that? I mean, it's it's, yeah. not, it's, it's okay, but it's nothing. It's nothing amazing. Yeah, you, you wouldn't put it in your top ten. Oh no, definitely not. No, no, definitely yeah. not. It was a very simple thing that we just did. It was like, yeah, it probably took us fifteen minutes to plan, um, half an hour to film, and probably two hours to edit, and it just continues to to get loads of views. Wow, that's awesome. That's cool. Uh, Eight million. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah. Crossfield, Crossfield once showed me his YouTube views for the month in minutes. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it was like 28 million or something. This is quite a while ago. 28 million minutes for the month. And I said, I said, Crossfield, you're ruining the world. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? I said, think of how productive People could have been for 28 million minutes, million but minutes. instead they sat there and watched you. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm just trying to help people. And you guys are doing the same. You guys are yeah, doing yeah. the same. It is crazy, though. When you look at it as in minutes, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty scary. Wow. It really is incredible. And I'm sure, I'm sure 
YouTube views and social media participation has really gone up during this time. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think more people are, more people are on their phones and do more. I have, I have to keep turning my phone off because I'm like, I just, it's, this, it's too close to me. I'm like, I need to carry on and work. So I, I often yeah. put it to the side and just get on with it. But um, yeah, I think uh, yeah. in this time, people are hungry for it, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they're looking for something. Eh? Andy, if you were to give just, just two or three little nuggets for a young golf coach starting out, and the reason why you guys are as successful as you are is because you've worked your butts off with good content and you've been persistent. But what you've done is you've de developed one of my favorite words is an audience. You have a mega audience. And with that audience comes this ability to, to have that little, you know, like I look at my collar here and my collar doesn't, <laughs> doesn't have an Audi logo on it. Yours yeah. does, okay? And, and when you have that big audience, you can have those kind of things and you, you carry a big stick in a positive way. Um, what can a young golf coach do starting now? They're early in their career. What can they do to work towards developing an audience? No matter what size it is, but just start to grow that audience. I think the... Um... I think they've, they've always got to think about putting out value. So we'll always talk about it. How can they put out value as much as possible? So instead of thinking about how can I get more followers or how can I get more likes or, or this, it's like, how can you create real stuff that, that actually connects with people and, and that they can go and use? So I think the first, first thing is, look, focus on giving the customer value. But mm. if you do that, all the other stuff will, will happen itself, the likes and the followers, right. and, and that'll, be, that'll, that'll happen. I think the, um, the next thing is that there's nobody, there's nobody going to be like you. And I think if you can be, if you can, the more you can be you, then the better. The more authentic you are, the better. Now, I think it's great to look at what other people do and learn from the best, but then, put, then deliver it in a way that's actually just true to what, who you are. And I think the more you are true to who you are, Mm. then the more you're going to access people who just like you for you and mm -hmm. you don't just blend in and you know you, you have the confidence just to be well I'm just going to be myself and I'm going to put it away in my personality what I would normally do not mm. what Andrew Rice does or not what Andy and Pierce or Ledbetter or these guys do because it's, it's so easy to do that and try and copy yeah them. but I think you've got to sort of you've got to model some of the things that people do but then put it off in your own way and go well I'm just going to have the confidence to be me but it's hard to do, I think, especially on social media when you've got a, a camera in your face. Sure. It's, um, it takes time to actually get past that and go, well, you know, I'm just going to show people who I am. And I think that, I mean, look, we still feel that we're really learning all the time and we feel it's sure. the start. We feel it's the start. And I think actually that's probably how we're always going to be because we're that sort, of, that sort of way. But I think the, the more you can show the, the, real, the real stuff, I think social media now... Um, People relate to people who are going through struggles and who are the same as them and, and things like that. So the more you can just show the realness of things, you know, the, yeah. the bad stuff and the, the hard stuff and things like that, I think it's uh, yeah. you can connect to people in a better way, really. So being truthful and being honest and being open and vulnerable is, I think, is a big thing that you can do on, online. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's great information there. And the common thread that I've had running through this lockdown series I, if someone were to say, what one word can you take from it in talking to all these great coaches and minds in golf is the word authentic. Be authentic, be true to yourself. Um, show that you're happy, show that you're sad and, uh, and just put some good information out there. Andy, I really appreciate you coming on, my friend. That's been great. Thank you so much for, you know, for having me on. And just look, the work that you do, Andrew, is great. Me and Pierce are always watching what you do. So Keep up the great stuff. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to watch, and we're always learning from you as well. So thank you for the stuff that you put out. Thanks, Dave. Stay safe. Appreciate everything. Appreciate everyone tuning in. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cheers, Andrew. Cheers, Annie. Thanks. Bye.